rolling. Uh, what do we got today, Pete? All right, Mark. In today's episode, we'll be talking about caffeine addiction. That's a new one for me, at least, to uh, talk about. We got radiant centerings. A little clarification needed on that one. How to balance productivity while quitting PMO. And then uh, Healthy Gamer, the YouTuber, is going to walk us through how to turn our wins into losses. And then, last but not least, Grant Cardone answers the question, what is enough money? Welcome, everybody, to Man vs. World, your favorite podcast for helping guys thrive in this insane modern world. I am your host, Mark Quepit, a life coach extraordinaire uh, professionally for the past 10 years, a decade in this game, man. It's pretty wild. Has it been 10 officially? I believe so. I have to look at the exact... I, I count it by the whenever my first uh, YouTube upload was, which was in... Uh, 20 2013 maybe it was later in the year i think it was in the winter sometime so we're definitely getting there we go. right up to it um and that's awesome. this is pete as always how you doing brother i'm doing great how you doing i'm doing good how's how's how are you liking the uh the shaved head you're gonna keep it up you're gonna grow it I'm out i'm gonna keep it up for now yeah just yeah. maybe uh maybe a little bit longer we'll see how i feel Okay, yeah, and peep that was that that stole the show on the for the comments last time. Oh, uh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember it was just the coldness uh, that got to me after a while, and then and then keeping up with it, I was surprised. It's like, shoot, I got to do this. Like, I got to like shave this shit like every like two days, otherwise it, you know, comes back yeah. pretty quick. It does. It does. It that, does that. That is what, until it doesn't anymore. Um, <laughs> do you do you think you're gonna go bald? Do you have the bald gene? Nah, so you got. They say you got to look at your got your it. your mother's father. Uh huh. If he was if he was a baldy, then uh, this might be a look that you got to get used to. You know, uh, I could do worse. Yeah, you could do yeah, worse. I could you do, do worse. worse. Um. All right. So what's first today? So first things first. I wanted to uh, talk about this caffeine problem. So we got a guy in the SMC who says, "I know this is a strange topic, and no one else I've talked to has experienced this." but caffeine is my number one trigger to relapse and I might be hypersensitive to it. A few years ago, I got addicted to drinking coffee at work and my life has fallen apart because of it. I relapse much more frequently, have a huge appetite and gain weight, feel exhausted after work and skip the gym, and then struggle to sleep at night and wake up feeling even more tired the next day. Hmm. And then the vicious cycle continues. I feel it's doing more harm than PMO itself and the good streaks I have don't feel as good as in the past because of caffeine. I'm actually addicted to it. I'm so tempted every day to drink it at work so I can feel good during my shift, but then all the consequences listed above happen and it's just not sustainable. Should I make PMO and caffeine the same streak? I've tried making them two separate streaks, but then I always tell myself as long as I don't PMO, it's fine. I feel like the only way I can take a caffeine ban seriously is if I combine it with my PMO streaks. So what do you think about this, Mark? Hmm. Well, caffeine is an interesting thing. It, re it affects everybody differently. Like my dad, he can, he'll drink like six cup of co cups of coffee today. He'll drink literally a cup of coffee and then like lie down and go to sleep in the evening. Um, if I've, I've quit caffeine before and it was, it was a bitch, man. It, it sucked. It took like two to three weeks for me to really start feeling normal. And I was only doing like, two to two and a half cups a day. It was back during uh, COVID where the the place I lived previously, I was just like in this basement and like, I just hated like working down there. So I would just like always go to the, the local coffee shop because they had like nice big windows and I would sit there and work and then I would just pound coffee. And uh, yeah, when I quit, I had like significant withdrawal symptoms. So I understand that it's, it's a tough thing and it, and it doesn't happen quickly like getting it out of your system it, there are going to be like for for me it was two weeks where i just felt like Egh, uh before i started feeling normal and i started drinking it again and uh i want to get off of it because i've just noticed that yeah it can it makes it like kind of seems like it condenses your like power into just like a small window in your day when i found when i found that when i was off of it i generally felt 
much better, like overall, like higher levels of focus. Um, so I, I understand the desire to quit it. It sounds like you have an even worse reaction to it uh, than me. Um, but, you know, it seems like, you know, it makes you feel good during work. Then you just crash later, um, which leads to you not keeping up with the gym, probably contributes to relapses and that kind of stuff. Or at least that's the way you're, you're experiencing it. So this is, this is kind of a tricky one um, because usually we, we want to avoid stacking stuff like this when you are um, trying to quit porn because like that's already going to create withdrawal symptoms in your brain and to take caffeine on top of that, which is also, I believe, like a, a dopamine stimulator um, off the table at the same time, you're you may have a couple of weeks where you do not feel great, maybe even up to three or four weeks where you don't feel great. And so on one hand, it's like, I don't know if you should be doing that. But then if the caffeine itself is causing you to relapse, then it might be the only way for you. So a couple of things. The the first one would be to like, if you are going to do both of them at the same time, you need to really take it easy on yourself. You got to like realize that, Hey, if you need to just be super chill for a few weeks, then just be super chill. You know, maybe you don't, you don't work out. Maybe you just focus on going for walks or something like that. Um, I think you should have some movement. I think that'll help, uh, just in everything, everything, like no one should be just sedentary uh, unless you're like really sick or something like that. But even then generally you're going to be benefiting from getting out, getting sunlight, that kind of stuff. Um, that's one thing you would probably want to try and do is make sure you get up and get direct sunlight, like in your eyes in the morning. I know that can really help with your energy levels and stuff like that. I know Andrew Huberman, he talks about that all the time. Like I didn't realize it's not just like, you know, vitamin D and stuff like that. Apparently getting that early morning sunlight into your eyes, like triggers all this shit in your cells and like syncs everything up and heals your circadian rhythm and all that kind of thing. I don't know. I haven't experimented with it too much least recent or lately, but uh, I would like to try it. So that's one thing. Another thing is there are some supplements out there and I might be, I'm probably going to be exploring this a little bit myself because I've gotten a little bit more uh, reliant on, you know, I'm doing about a cup of coffee a day and then I'm also doing, um, nicotine more than I would want, like particularly in the form of like those, those pouches and whatnot. And I want to come off of them as well. So I'm going to be playing around with some supplements to that, that they claim can help with coming off of it. One of them is rhodiola that I've read up on. Um, another is, uh, DL phenylalanine. Um, Mm -hmm. so I've heard both of those can kind of help when you're, when you're coming off of like caffeine or nicotine, I forget one of them is tied to each thing, but they might have a synergistic effect. I don't know. So you may want to try that, maybe do a little research and see if there's anything else, because you're going to want to probably get whatever sort of edge that you can. Um, while you do this, you may even want to, if you're going to go down the supplemental route, look at a nootropic that can help with focus. Um, like a particularly like a, a, kind of like a choline supplement or like I found my favorite daily nootropic is actually the GNC brain health blend. I feel like I can take that pretty much every day. And, you know, at some point I might cycle off that or whatever, but that one seems great. I really like that one a lot. It really helps with focus. And if you want to be like a laser, you can get like, um, there's this stuff called Cognizant, which is like another choline supplement. And that one, that one, I feel like if I do that one too much, it just like, I'll get headaches or something. Um, but as a one-off kind of like, if you need a focus boost, that's not caffeine. That's a, I like that one a lot. So some kind of supplementation, maybe something you want to experiment with, um, you know, doctor supervision, all that stuff. I'm not, you know, no medical experts. So don't take it as medical advice for me, but those are things you might want to consider. Um, but other than that, man, it's it's going to be more about your mindset around it. It's going to be about how are you going to give yourself permission to go through this process? And, you know, what's going to be, what are you going to be telling yourself when you just feel like shit, right? You got to find that reason. And if it's just to quit porn, well, that's probably not enough. It's got to be, what does quitting porn get you? What does getting off of caffeine get you? You know, like what kind of things would that put you in the position to accomplish, you know, like, you know, if you're off porn and caffeine, 
what do you think you could do with your career? What do you think you could do with your fitness? What do you think you could do with your relationships, right? And then to take it even deeper, it's like, well, what kind of man does that let you become? You know, if we're going to take it down all the way to the level of identity, what kind of man are you, right? Like, are you, you're, like if you're going to go at it from this uh, identity standpoint, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who, who doesn't need caffeine. I don't need a stimulant in my life. I don't need an artificial uh, sexual replacement, an artificial sexual stimulant like porn. You know, it's like I'm, I'm a guy who, who lives life natural or however you want to put it. You got to find that kind of I am statement. I'm the kind of guy who. Um, and if you can find something like that that really resonates with you, that's where I think most of the power comes from because that, that's not a logical argument. There might be logical elements supporting it, but it's when you can make a habit change from that place of identity of it's just like, oh, this is the kind of guy I am. It's just more of like a matter of preference and ration, rationalizations. They, they tend to, to melt against something like that because you can't, you know, what, what can you say? It's like, to, what can someone say to that? It's like, if, if I just say, oh, I'm quitting porn to be productive. Well, someone might say, well, maybe if you use porn a little bit, you could be more productive right now. You're not going to have this productivity dip. Or maybe you could say, well, there's plenty of productive guys out there who use porn. So, you know, clearly it's not going to just make you more productive magically. Uh, You know, you probably could become productive even while you're still using it, right? That's a, you know, you don't want to, as much as possible, you want to avoid stepping into that rational realm if you're trying to really permanently change, you know, having those rational conversations are useful, but eventually you want to arrive at that. Yeah. I'm just not a kind of guy who watches porn. It's cause like, what, what can someone say to that? <laughs> it's just like, Oh, uh, I don't, uh, you shouldn't be. And it's like, well, I am. <laughs> and once you can get that point, you're going to be pretty powerful. So, um, you know, you gotta be the kind of guy that decides that, you know, you're a dude who is willing to make these kind of sacrifices regardless of, you know, how uncomfortable they are in the moment because you care about the the long-term results. So that's the way I would approach it. Awesome. All right, next up, Grant Cardone answers the question, what is enough money? Let's go ahead and take a look what he has to say. Yeah, you guys keep asking me what enough money is. How many times I got to tell you? First of all, if you're asking the question, you don't have enough money. Number two, enough money by definition, at least my definition, would be you can take care of everyone you love, everyone, all the people, your sister that you forgot about, your aunt that took care of you when you were growing up, maybe a school teacher that helped you out a bunch is struggling now, but you can help your two kids, your wife or husband, and your parents, and beyond that, you know what I'm saying? You can reach deep, start helping all the people you love. That would be enough money, and still take care of yourself by the way i know some of you out there taking care of everybody else but you don't take care of yourself so you'd have to be able to take care of everybody you love all the people you forgot that you love and the people that can't take care of themselves the guy on the street corner that you're like dude i feel sorry for this guy i want to help him out you can take care of all those people and yourself and i'm not done okay when you expire and you're done your history you can't work anymore can't produce anymore you're ex- you're expired you would steal, you had enough money to steal, take care of the people you love, the things you love, the charities you love, the causes that you believe in. Yeah, that's what would be enough money. Hmm. It's an interesting take. I, I totally see why he looks at it like that, you know, like the, and I think he also has <laughs> financial incentive to put forth that definition because uh, a significant portion of his business is built around making people more money. So if he can make them think that, oh, I need to make even, even more, well, then maybe I'm going to have to keep working with Grant Cardone in order to be able to, to reach that goal. So, I mean, I see a little bit of, you know, self-serving thought process in there. And, uh, you know, the the counter argument is that of that is like, well, is that the only way to to live life? Is is that the thing? Is like is that all? Is that the main thing that you should be focusing on providing in this world? Is an abundance of money so that you can take care of people in that way? I don't. I just don't think that is the path for everyone. I think for some people it is. If you've got a love of making money and you've got a love of doing the kind of work you feel called to, the work of producing large amounts of money, 
then 100% adopt that mentality. Like that's a good way to look at making money. It's way better than the idea around making money of I just want to buy myself a whole bunch of cool shit and be, you know, higher status than other people, right? So, you know, I like it from that perspective. But like, what if you want to be an artist? What if you want to be um, more of the guy who's, you know, feet on the ground, like helping individuals like one on one, like, there, there's always going to be a trade off in the way that you use your energy. And at the end of the day, some people need to be the doers, the, the people who actually implement things, right? Like if you're, if you're, if you're an excellent surgeon, for example, okay. And your and your biggest gift is that you can perform life-saving operations on people. Okay. Um, you know, should you just be focusing on maximizing money or should you be focusing on making sure that, you know, the most people possible can get access to the kind of treatments that you can provide? You know, maybe you just focus on healing the people that only you can heal. Okay. Like, is it wrong that you don't get enough money to buy everyone in your neighborhood a car? I don't necessarily think so. Right. It's like these kinds of black or white mentalities around money, um, they're they're nice because they simplify the world. It's like, oh, well, Grant Cardone says it's got to be this much money. So if I don't make that kind of money, then I don't have enough. And then how are you going to feel? You're going to feel shitty. You're going to feel in a state of lack. And maybe that's just not your calling. You know, this is one of these things where you got to really feel it out. And is it possible to always figure out how to add more money to the process? Like say we're, you know, you're that surgeon, um, you know, maybe there is a way in which you can patent the technology and do partnerships and shit like that and get into business so that you can make money, but you want to make sure, but what if the, the mission for you is more about, well, I want to, I actually know a guy like this. Um, he's big into helping, uh, improve the medical, um, what do you want to call it? Capabilities in Africa. Okay, like he wants to be able to like train people in how to be better, better usage of anesthesia and stuff like that. Because apparently in Africa, anesthesia like kills a lot of people. And so it's like, you know, he's working more with like non, he's interested in working more with like nonprofits and th stuff like that. So that, you know, Af these African nations can get way better health care. Now, he's not pursuing it as a way where he can just make a shit ton of money, you know, at like maybe he could probably get a slice of things through grants and things like that or whatever. But for the most part, he's trying to get the money over there because he's just trying to help people. Okay. Is that guy a sucker? You know, cause he's not trying to optimize for profit. I don't think so. Um, is there a way in which he could optimize, optimize for more profit? Maybe. So it's like, I think there's, there's definitely, there's people out there who need to be more open to the idea of making tons of money. Because in a lot of cases, making a bunch of money could make things better. And there are often very healthy, spiritually aligned, philanthropic ways to make more money. You know, like, capitalism doesn't need to be bad. There can be conscious capitalism where it's like, it's really just a net win for everybody involved. Um, but sometimes that's just not efficient. Sometimes that's not really doable. Sometimes that's just really, it goes against the person's fundamental drive and calling. Okay. And that's okay too. So it's like, you know, on one hand, some people I think need to be more open to the idea of making money. Some people maybe need to be a little less focused on it, but it's, it's one of these things where you're gonna have to feel it out for yourself. Um, and it might be different at different stages in your life, but I mean, in general, uh, you want to have enough, right? <laughs> Everyone at least wants to have enough. Like if you can get everything that you want personally, you're doing pretty good. If you can take care of your family, your, your immediate family, okay, you're doing even better. Do you really need to take care of that teacher? Ah, uh, that's not a responsibility. That's a nice to have, right? And so it's, you just got to figure out like, how are you going to prioritize things in your life? Buying that third grade teacher, you know, their uh, medicine or something like that. How high up on that list is it versus you pursuing some other kind of dream, some kind of other kind of career path, that sort of thing? It's not a cut and dry thing, I think, for everybody. Um, it's great that Grant Cardone's got it figured out, but um, you know, I don't think everybody's going to necessarily walk that that path, and I don't think that's necessarily wrong either. The next thing I wanted to get your take on is we got a comment in the Reforged Man thread of the SMC 
where somebody says, what is the purpose of radiant centering? Is it to handle urges or is it to calm down? So what is the purpose? Yeah, let's let's explain what radiant centering is. So in my Reforge Man course, um, at the end of most of the modules, I have a video talking about this, pra this practice I call radiant centering. And it does a few different things, but I'll tell you like the, the, like the basics of the practice right now. Um, it's a breathing technique, a meditative technique that will help you really relax. Okay. So it's kind of like two steps. The first thing is to do what I call spontaneous relaxation, where it's just like, you kind of see me doing a little bit, like sometimes at the beginning of these, these podcasts and stuff where you see me stretching, uh, taking some breaths, shaking it out. That's spontaneous relaxation where you just like feel tension in your body and just kind of shake it out. You do that for a minute. You maybe take some breaths in, hold your breath, let it go. Just kind of like all you're doing is releasing tension. Okay. And that sets the stage. That's the first thing. And just learning how to do spontaneous relaxation in general is uh, a very simple way to learn how to create a, a brain state shift because by, you know, there's like, you can, you can, uh, you can change your mood in two different ways. You can change it by changing your thought process, which in turn affects your biological systems, you know, release, like, you know, maybe releasing some oxytocin, you know, stop releasing so much cortisol, that kind of thing. Um, but you could also go the other way where you change the body and then that changes the mood, which in turn changes the mind. So, you know, this is taking more of a body first approach. So after you relax a little bit, the, the radiant centering part is focused around a technique I call edge breathing. And edge breathing is sort of a unique breathing technique. I haven't seen anyone else teach it. As far as I know, I developed it. Um, maybe it's it shows up somewhere. I mean, there's so many freaking breathing techniques out there. I'm sure someone else has done something similar. But the way it works is like this, is you slow down your breathing to the point just before it feels too slow. So if you breathe too slow, you're gonna start feeling deprived of oxygen, okay? With edge breathing, you wanna go right before that point. So right before the point of, of any sort of discomfort. And you just lower your, your breathing rate. And you're gonna have to monitor this in real time and adjust in as the oxygen levels and stuff and the gases uh, in your blood um, change. But what ends up happening when you do this is that you have the experience of like feeling like you're a, like about to run out of air, but then when you take that breath in, you're getting filled with the air. So it's like you find this 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 balance between feeling deprived and fulfilled at the same time. And when you breathe like this, just at this slower rate, right on the edge of you know not having enough um, to feel a little bit of discomfort, if you breathe right at that edge, you just get really relaxed because your body's trying to, it starts trying to you know conserve. It doesn't want to like hold on to extra tension because it realizes okay the oxygen levels are, are are lowering and that sort of thing. And so learning how to surf that edge does a lot of things for you. It trains you to one, build a real-time self-awareness of your internal system, okay? Because you have to track it in real time. It's not just one fixed breathing rate. It'll be at one rate when you first start, and then as you get more relaxed, it'll be at an even lower rate. Um, and it also helps you become aware of tension in your body. And you can actually, like, when you apply this uh, breathing technique to emotional work, it, it's almost like... Um, wearing like insulated clothing when you're working with like electrical wires all right so if you ground yourself like this with edge breathing before you do intense inner work it makes it a lot easier you're far less likely to get overwhelmed and scared so if you're trying to like for example process a craving for uh porn all right if you just go into it all jacked up and torqued up from whatever sort of tensions you built up throughout the day you're much more likely to get overwhelmed, get thrown into a negative state, etc. But if you get yourself into a state of edge breathing first, you, you start become, becoming centered, um, you're going to be able to deal with much bigger emotional charges far more safely, far more consciously. Okay, So that's another big piece of it. Um, and then if we want to take it further, you can add another layer to the technique. 
And this is where you start in, uh, adding intentionality to it. And so what you do then is like you get comfortable with the edge breathing part of it and you move into tying gratitude to the inhale where you're feeling, oh, I'm getting what I want. And then you add goodwill to the exhale. So it's like an intention of goodness. And the, the goal is to direct it, write it to the, to the center of your heart. All right. So it's like gratitude for what you feel, whatever you're feeling in your heart and then goodwill toward whatever you feel in your heart. Gratitude on the inhale, goodwill on the exhale. And this gives you like a um, it, it teaches you how to turn on kind of like your I guess you could call it your love circuits in you biologically. Um, and that's that's an incredibly powerful skill to have because uh, it's that spirit of self-love that's really rooted in a spirit of gratitude and goodwill that puts you in the optimum position of doing any kind of emotional work or even any kind of external work, okay? And what I found is that like as you do this kind of thing, as you, you learn how to do this, eventually edge breathing becomes like a, uh, a reflexive uh, response. Um, so it's like if you have this formal practice, you practice like, you know, five to 10 minutes each day, eventually you're going to be able to just start doing it when you need it. So for me, as soon as I start getting stressed out, if I get worked up for something or if I need to center myself for something, maybe I got a, a podcast to film or a client to work with and I'm sort of out of sorts, I will naturally go into this state of centering of, of you know, gratitude, goodwill, releasing the tension and becoming very, very present. And I've just found it to be like, a Swiss army knife of um, internal skills. And if, you know, so what does it do? It does a lot. <laughs> it does all kinds of things. It helps you handle urges. It helps you calm down. And um, it can even, you know, it goes even further than that, but I'll, I'll save that for, you know, people who are interested, you can check it out in the Reforge Man course. But hopefully that's enough to, to get you guys uh, to start playing around with it. And just simple guideline is if you feel like it's too hard, you feel like you're not getting enough air, then breathe a little faster, okay? If you just feel nothing, then breathe a little slower, <laughs> okay? And eventually you're gonna find this spot, spot where it's just like you got this warm vibration, this like this nice feeling that flows through you and it's a kind of like a um, internal pleasure switch, you know, that makes you feel a bit better that you can have on demand any time of day, which is really awesome when, you know, if you're dealing with escapism issues because why do we reach for escapism? Because we wanna feel better. But what if you can feel better just inside your own head by changing the way you you think and breathe? So that's that's really the the purpose of it is to give people a a little bit of a, a technique to have more mastery over your own internal states. So I would love for you guys to try it out. Let me know you know what you think of it. And if you want to hear more about it, obviously you want to get into the self mastery club. Click the link below and uh, go for, through the Reforge Man course. Awesome stuff. All right. The next thing I wanted to show you is this video by Healthy Gamer on how to turn wins into losses. 1% progress is better than zero. Well said, Rockstar. You know what the biggest problem in our community is? Biggest problem in our community is when we say, if you get 1% better, that's a win, right? You've made progress. That's a W. It goes in the W column. Then what we do when we do get 1% better is we move it over to the L. We take our wins and we turn them into losses. I could have done 2%. First way that we reduce it to an L. Second way we reduce it to a, that person did 2% and I only did 1%. Now a W moves to the L. Third thing we say to ourselves, oh, why didn't I do this yesterday? Takes a W and moves it into an L. You wanna know why everyone is stuck today? It's because we take all of our wins and we book them as losses. And then we look at our lives and we're like, it's a string of L's all the way down. That's the problem. Data that shows that people who have imposter syndrome do this. Number one thing that leads to imposter syndrome. The one behavior you can change to fix imposter syndrome is stop moving your W's to L's. And we all do it every single day. Hmm. That's an interesting uh, way to, to, to tie that up is in the imposter syndrome thing. I've never, like, I've heard so many people say, we all struggle with imposter syndrome. I'm not the best to comment on it because I've never struggled with imposter syndrome. I don't, I don't really know what that feels like. And maybe that's, maybe that means I'm like a, a narcissist or, you know, something like that. I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but if that helps with that, then that's a hundred percent something you should do. And yeah, I, it's very easy to shit on yourself for not making enough progress. This is something that, you know, is a ongoing like debate 
even in our community, even after so much I stress about work, I think we even have a question later today about like, oh, I need to do more. I need to do more. Um, and I get it. We all do want to do more. But the thing that matters more than any one instant, instantaneous measurement or measurement over one small time period is what is your trajectory? Because trajectory is what really, you're even just the perception of trajectory is what matters the most for how you feel about yourself. You think, think about it like this, all right? Like a uh, homeless guy who's, you know, really rough place, depressed, you know, maybe hooked on drugs, whatever, he finds $100. Okay, he's feeling like he's going up. His day just got a lot better. His trajectory is going up, and he's feeling good. Compare that to the guy who's you know uh, hedge fund manager, rich as hell, and he sees his you know portfolio starting to tank and go down. The homeless guy is feeling better in that moment because it's all about which way do you see yourself going, not really where you're at. And so learning how to view yourself as constantly winning is probably one of the best ways to continuously manifest more wins because when you feel like you're winning then you're going to behave like a winner you're going to take the actions of a winner you're going to feel good about yourself right and to some extent like we can't get too tied up with this like i've seen people do weird things with this like tie themselves in knots over um trying to turn every single thing into like oh that's great i am incredibly grateful for this experience and there's a lot of power in that practice don't get me wrong but at a certain point it, that can almost become repressive like you see this in kind of like some of the 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 woo woo new age people they kind of have this oh yeah it's everything's all peace and love oh and they're like eyes are a little too wide and they they talk like this and like that sort of thing it's like those are the people who have uh, repressed all of their, their negative emotion because they are always trying to see everything in this, you know, positive light. Um, I think if you're going to try and if, I, if I'm going to get at the risk of maybe getting a little too complex with it, I think it's almost more like how can you hold negative energy in a positive way? So let me just do an example here, okay? Say you get 1% better. Okay, yes. Do what he says. See it as a win, etc. But what do you do about the part of you that says, well, I wanted 2% better. I wanted 3% better. Okay? Should you just tell that part to shut up? No. I don't think you should. I think what you need to do then is you need to reframe it. Like I had a video um, a little while back about practical prayer. I called it tactical prayer, actually. Um, and what it does is like we where the, the the mental state I think is that is most powerful to learn how to cultivate is a mental state of anticipation rather than a state of deprivation. So if you're viewing that one percent as not good enough, well then you're gonna feel deprived. Okay, and that's going to lead to this negative emotional reaction inside of yourself. It's gonna make you not feel so good and you know, all that kind of thing. It can spiral from there. But, you know, say 1% isn't what you're aiming for, you want more. The trick then is how can I spin that into anticipation? So it's like, hey, we got 1%, awesome. Okay, we're moving in the right direction, but it's not where I want to be yet. Oh, I have this negative emotion. Just take that negative emotion and be like, all right, here's what I want. I want to hit 2% next time. And then try and cultivate a spirit of anticipation for that outcome. You know, the way I do it, you know, spiritually speaking, is I, I turn it into a prayer. Right, I, I I take that chaotic sense of negativity and I direct it. Okay, and I direct it toward, dear God, please help me do better next time. Please help me take this further next time. And when I do it, like when you do something as simple as that, simply grabbing all that negative energy and binding it to a, an intention like that, that like organizes it in your brain. And you can do this with anything. It's like, oh. The, that girl didn't get back to me. So you're swirling. There's this negative emotional chaos of deprivation inside of you. And then you say, okay, well, I hope she responds to me later. That's it. You know, dear Lord, please, please, if this, this relationship is meant to work out, please let this, you know, please let me hear from her later. Or maybe you say, well, I'm going to probably text her again, or I'm going to, you know, maybe approach 
a different woman and handle it differently. Or maybe I'm just going to hope that I'm going to be myself in the exact same way and just hope for better uh, outcomes with the next woman or whatever it is. You just need to fix, fix your mind on the thing that you want rather than the thing that you don't, right? The thing that if you put all your energy in the thing that you don't want, the thing that's lacking, then you will feel deprivation. If you at least then you can take anything like that, any sense of lack, turn it into, well, here's what I do want. And I'm going to let myself anticipate that. And part of the process of getting yourself to really buy into that anticipation is you have to actually take the practical actions. You have to trust that you're going to follow through all that kind of stuff. Um, and usually you will, right? Like it's like, you can even get kind of meta with this stuff too, where it's like, um, you know, say I'm, I'm feeling unproductive. Okay. Say I'm like, Oh, I don't want to do any work. What I'm, and, and I'm feeling stressed about it. Well, I can just sit there in that state of productive deprivation where it's like, Oh, I don't have any motivation. Oh, oh, it's like, I'm screwed. I'm, you know, I lost my edge. Instead I can be like, you know what? I want to get back into a productive groove. And I can look forward to that, you know, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to feeling that fire come back, feeling that alignment come back, feeling that, you know, play and engagement come back. And as soon as I, I put it in, I wrap it up in that way in my mind, everything starts to change. I start to move toward it. I start to see opportunities to, to move in that direction. Um, I start, you know, like that, that, you know, homeless guy we talked about who got $100, you know, he's, who knows what he's looking forward to spending that on, but he's looking forward to it, right? And so we can always, always, always be planning what we are looking forward to. And we can believe in it, right? Because we have a lot of power over our lives. But if you're just sitting there spiraling what you don't have, then uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Very true. You know, <laughs> pain is considered by most people, I think, to be only bad. But the, there's a reason that we have, we experience pain just in our physical bodies. You know, if you go over to the hot stove and you put your hand there and you don't feel pain, you lose your hand, you know? <laughs> right. It's going to suck. And I'm learning how to distinguish between negative emotions that are good and negative emotions that are bad is, I think, a very important skill. I think oftentimes we just label every negative emotion as bad when sometimes they're a warning signal to say, hey, you're doing something wrong here. You know, not always, but. Yeah, I mean, and like like every negative emotion can be transformed into some kind of positive anticipation. You know, if you you break your arm, you can sit there and whine about, oh, I can't lift anymore. My bicep's going to get smaller, blah, blah, blah. Or you can look forward to, yeah, I can't wait to lift again. I can't wait till I'm, you know, strong and healthy again. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, if you get good at this, you've really mastered joy, the joy in life. <laughs> because for for a lot of things, the anticipation is as much fun, if not more fun than the actual event. I'm sure you've had things like that where it's like you were, you know, I remember as a kid, I would be like so excited for Christmas and, uh, you know, and getting presents and shit like that. And it's like, yeah, Christmas was awesome. Finally getting to open up those presents and everything. But like, you know, I had almost as much fun just looking forward to it. There was that much excitement. So it's like that's that's really where the, a lot of the dopamine and stuff comes from is is the anticipation of the reward um, more so than even just the reward itself. And I think we've gotten lazy with this kind of thing because so much of our pleasure today is immediately accessible that we've lost our our internal musculature for anticipation. Everybody just wants it like right away, wants it like immediately, you know, Um but like, you know, particularly if you are someone of a, you know, traditional Abrahamic religion, okay, you believe that really the best shit's going to happen after this life, you know, we're going to be in heaven, okay? So it's like, well, what if you learn how to anticipate that? What if you learn how to look forward to that? What if you, you know, jo joyfully anticipate, you know, entering into that, that higher plane and you use your life as a way to continuously get closer and closer to it, right? Like that's... That's what it means to be on a journey. And I think just biologically and the way our brains are wired, that's actually going to give you the most fulfilling life, you know, moment by moment, you know, living in the present. And an interesting point I heard from this book called The, uh, the Silence of Adam. Uh, it was a book about like masculinity, like looking back at like, you know, the, the, the fall of man and that sort of thing. And the argument it made was that the, the fundamental failing of Adam and Eve was that they were impatient 
because basically it's like, you know, the, the idea is that they knew God. They knew him in all his, his glory and goodness and that sort of thing. And he gave them one command, which was don't eat of this tree. And they wanted to eat of the tree, right? And so they felt like they were being deprived of something. But if they really believed that God was good, then he was going to fulfill whatever that lack was at some point. They just weren't patient enough to like let it unfold. You know, they, they grasped after it right out of from a place of feeling deprived. And so I, I think there's a very deep lesson in there for all of us in pretty much everything that we do. You know, the more you can cultivate this anticipation, this hopeful anticipation, uh, I think the more powerful and fulfilled you are, you will become. I agree. Yeah. Well, last but not least, I wanted to get your take on this final post here from the SMC New member says, hi guys, I'm happy to find this group. I'm overruling Mark Kweppet's recommendation not to take on too much, too fast, by wanting to get back into productivity game. Although I'm only 45 days hard mode quitting porn. I won't blame Mark if it all goes wrong. At the same time, I want to take on responsibility here for myself. And the truth is, there is financial threats pending that will hit me in about a year's time that I cannot ignore. And if I don't do anything about them, I feel... The standstill in that direction might threaten my sobriety as much as overwhelm by too many challenges. So it's a kind of lose-lose situation in which I feel more comfortable doing at least something rather than just being afraid and possibly relapsing. So Mark, what would you uh, say to someone who is trying to quit porn but also has to live life at the, at the same time, it seems like? Well, it's interesting that he's framing it like I'm against that because I'm not. I'm just all for doing it intelligently. So like if you guys want to kind of get the framework in more detail, you can click the the training below and you can watch the section about the stack method because that's how I really recommend going about balancing your energy expenditure during, you know, a big habit change like quitting porn, okay? Um and so the 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 short version of it is this. All right, you have to establish what I would call your hard line set of habits and behaviors and then your main line so we could call it like you know level one and your level two and this is like a really a range so it's like your level one your hard line is about like okay what do you need to do at minimum you know to to keep yourself relatively on track right and to not screw up your main objective so in this case his main objective is to you know i guess get some work done and then also not use porn so What's the minimum that you could do every single day, even if it's a really bad day? Like, even if you're just like crushed with cravings, what's the minimum you feel confident that you could get yourself to do? Well, you know, hopefully it'd be stay clean and then it would be some level of productivity. And that's going to be different for person to person. Like if you're someone who um, runs your own business or something like that, maybe it's half an hour, an hour of focused work. You could probably still do that even if you're in a really crappy place, all right? Um, but that's not what you want, need to do every day because you're not going to feel like garbage every single day. You know, he's at day 45. So, I mean, he's, you know, might still get some pretty rough days in there, but he's moving through the process. And so it's like, okay, well, what's that? That's when we go up to our main line. If you're feeling all right, then go for more. You know, do three hours, do four hours, right? You just want to try to avoid putting yourself into a place of um, like snapback, right? That's really what it is. It's like, cause there, there have been a ton of guys I know who um, like, let me, like an example, here's one guy I'm working with now. He's got some debt and he has the ability to work overtime at his job. And one of the biggest causes for his relapses is that he then takes on these big overtime kicks, these big shifts. And then he's just completely depleted the following day and he relapses because he's just like, you know, he, he, he doesn't seem to have the, the, the strength to handle that kind of stuff consistently. And so it's like, I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm just saying maybe we shouldn't be doing a lot of overtime right now. That's all. And so it's like, if you're saying, well, I got to do a lot of overtime right now, well, then you got to be a lot stronger, you know? And if you've got like the, the only reason I would say that you if you've if you've got to push extreme in productivity and quitting porn, the only way you can pull that off is if there is strong external motivation, because generally 
if it's just left up to our own devices, it's really just left up to our own motivational force, um, that's not going to work for most people. There needs to be some kind of big external thing. Like, for example, like if someone was like, hey, I'll kill your daughter if you don't do this extreme habit change. It's like, well, there's no habit change I wouldn't be able to do if under that kind of circumstance because there is a incredible external motivator, right? And so I'm not saying it needs to be that extreme, but there's you have to understand that many of like some of our our motivational uh, power exists outside of ourselves. And so if you're in a situation where you have to get shit done, well, great, you've got free power. Your, your brain's going to unlock stuff for you that you wouldn't have access by your own force of will. So, you know, you just got to be careful here. You just got to be honest with yourself. And then uh, th one of the big things you really want to probably think about is like adding a lot of intentionality around your downtime. So it's like you have to plan downtime and you have to take it as seriously as your productivity. So if you're planning on crushing it during the week, then, you know, two times a week minimum, you got to make sure that you're planning some fun. You're planning some some steam release, okay? And uh, even even people who are working their asses off, they can have two times a week where they they give themselves a few hours to like get out in nature, hang out with some friends, that kind of thing. What you don't want is to have all of your rest be done unintentionally, where you're just like cruising lowbrow stimulation on YouTube or whatever, because that's not actually going to recharge you. That's actually just draining you in another way. Um, and uh, you do that, then I, I just don't think it's going to work. So if you add a significant level of intentionality to making sure you have some fun, relaxation, some you know steam release or whatever, and uh, you've got the strong external motivation and you are trying to work this stack method properly, then I think you can pull it off. Um, but, you know, you got to be real with yourself. You know, you, re you really do. You have to figure out is like, where is that line for you? You're 45 days in. That's an awesome streak. OK, that's you're 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 right on the edge of claiming this thing. And it's like, how much do you want to gamble that? Can you really not wait just a few more weeks to like kick things up into like a higher gear? If you really can't, then just do it smart, stay aware, do all the journaling, all the stuff I teach in the Reforge Man course, stay connected to the community. If you do that, you can do it. Just, you know, make sure you're you're not um you're not putting your priorities out of order. And if you don't do that, then I think you're gonna be okay. Some stuff. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us this week. I will see you next week. If you haven't checked out the free training in the description, go ahead and do that. There's three really powerful free tools that you can start implementing right away in your journey to getting free from this stuff. So that's all we got. Yep. Thanks for showing up, everybody. It's a little bit of a shorter episode. We're going to, maybe we'll try and beef these up. Actually, we got some, I got a bunch of plans for how we're going to beef this show up, but uh, nice. I don't know if we're ready to implement them just yet. Anyway, appreciate you guys watching. You know, it's it's really fun doing this show. I think we're, we're uh, I'm curious to see where we're going to be at after 100 episodes. That's a magic number, right? We're going to be probably what, three, four million subs. That's the, that's the goal, right? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right, I think we'll get there. <laughs> All right, ooyap, everybody. See you in the next one.